and my reflection is Dieter was, thanks for that fabulous talk, Dieter. Um, it's a, a walk through memory lane for me as I watch that work from distance. Uh, so it's a, an honor, uh, Henry, to celebrate uh, your remarkable journey as a scholar, a mentor, an innovator. I'll just say to the group that my connection with Henry, um, I'm not sure if he remembers this or not, but I certainly do, it dates back to the mid 1980s. Uh, the connection was forged in our shared curiosity about models of limited rationality, probability and utility theory, uh, the roles of those methods, as we each uh, sought to unravel, unravel the, the enigma of intelligence. So it seems like just yesterday when we had our first engaging discussion over email, uh, I was really intrigued with Henry's doctoral research and the directions he was pursuing uh, in his then uh, new role at Bell Labs. And I was looking for feedback on my dissertation research uh, Henry was extremely positive and supportive about what I was trying to do with taking a decision theoretic approach to ideal computation and action under varying and limited um, computing resources. How he's been work with working with students over the years and has been just a fabulous role model and, and supportive influence. He's always been a guiding light, uh, nurtured countless scholars into becoming leaders and innovators in their fields. Uh, I think his deep commitment to students is captured uh, today in the diversity and strength and their success in the world. It's a testament to his uh, nurturing spirit and his dedication to people and community and to the advancement of science more generally. Uh, spanning from his uh, research at Bell Labs uh, through his impactful endeavors at, at, at UW onto his efforts uh, and achievements uh, in scholarship and organization, uh, at Rochester and then at NSF, uh, Henry's contributions have really left, it, uh, le left a, a lasting imprint on the field. Um, among my collaborations with him, one particularly vibrant set of projects that come to mind is our work, uh, along with Bart Selman and Carla Gomes, and I see um, uh, uh, Bart online right now. We took a, a probabilistic Bayesian approach to solving satisfiability problems. Now that's exciting research. It was quite a, at the time, a, quite a novel perspective on, on computational hardness. Onward. <laughs> Thanks. In terms of recognition, um, this was the ACM award. So. <laughs> That was our routine. Uh, because you know, to do research, you need to drink a lot of coffee. 
Um, and so we generated, you know, incredible number of best papers. So for a while we were, we would generate the most best papers of any AI group in the country. Uh, and, and this was one of the pictures that was taken by, by the Bellas photographer where we had in the coffee uh, and Ms. Alan Levy there, uh, who also had, had his own best paper. Um, so, so we were advertising the, the, the children of the group. Um, this was with Ms. Vaughan, this is in 2000, Ron Blackman, who was a big supporter. He actually sort of brought that group together, uh, and, it, and it was a lot of fun. So it was a lot of fun to be, just hang out uh, and be able to do. Ron make sure you could do whatever you wanted to do, as long as it was good research, okay? Um, ah, so, being a team of two, I reflected on this. We worked very, very close together. We also ended up going to all the conferences together, and so we were always sort of together, um, which actually had some interesting consequences. So for some, we were like a couple quantum spin pair, and some uh, more senior researchers uh, had a hard time telling us apart. Okay, and, and I find this very odd. But, you know, at the time, as a, as a young person, and I thought, oh, how is that possible? But as an old person, I see the young students they're like, huh. Oh. Um, you know, uh, I, I understand it better, you know, that, that, yeah, young people look the same, uh, just like old people look the same. Yeah. So, uh, so they had a hard time, so, so this left, you know, uh, one go, good colleague and former still not being calls me, uh, you know, uh, we still haven't quite figured out uh, that there are two of us. Um, so, Another thing I used to do is at some point I lost my badge. Uh, so Henry gave me his badge. Uh, I, think, I don't know actually. Henry was going to uh, foreign park, I think, at that time. But I was still going to Bella for, for a little bit. Henry gave me his badge. They had cameras, they had guards at the door. But I would just show Henry his badge and look at the badge and say, hmm, okay. Closing uh, <laughs> us. Uh, and I would go into the building. Uh, I still have the badge. Uh, I would get that back to you. Um, okay. Ah, a hidden skill. Okay, so now we get to the, the wrap up. Um, so Henry, by the way, is one of the best coders you'll ever encounter. I, I never really, you know, it took me a while to appreciate it because I didn't see that many other coders. But over the years, I've seen more and more coders, <laughs> including pro, uh, students, of course. And they're really like, gee, you know, nobody actually can code as well as Henry does. Nobody. Um, um, and, you know, that. That led to these 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 code repositories. You now, one one of my favorite examples is that Donald Knuth, who is actually the founder of computer science, and one of the co I think I can't even think of another guy. He's definitely the founder of computer science. He went to Henry's code on Walkstand, and after going through the whole code, I guess he could he could improve it by a few percentage points again. It would speed up a little bit. This was I think version 44 because by the way. The code version is version 55 now. Um, it, it, it runs beautifully. You can download it. It will, it will check out what computer it's running on. It will figure out your configuration. It will, you know, the, the compilation file, the make file is, is many pages long. Uh, so we don't have to study the code, found a little improvement, but that's the best coder. I would say that, you know, possibly the best computer scientist in the world. So, um, so that gets an idea of, of, of Henry's coding ability. Set, set plan, he did, that distribution, uh, and it's all beautiful code, and it always runs, you know. Um, so, at, at some point, I, I had a, a, a little recent project with one of my students. Uh, we wanted to visualize what was going on. You download it, and, and And Rory composed an unmatched place in my heart. So whenever I step into unfamiliar domains, like in the finance industry I recently joined, which is just literally a week ago, wow, very intense. <laughs> and also in a previous company that I worked for in creating human resources com uh, software, where I built a product to detect unconscious bias in human language in workplace communication. I have the values I carry with me in every new venture. And Harry's passion for learning and innovation never ceases. During a recent meeting, which is this picture shows, I was eager to hear tales of their relaxing retirement from Harry, perhaps some stories like of fishing anecdotes. Instead, Harry was partly talking about 
advising and coding for a robotic excavator, uh, writing research proposals, and last month he even published code to educate ChatGPT in how to use a calculator. By far, his code is the most easy to understand among all the codes I can find on the internet. Thank you, Harry. So 10 years post-graduation, I still find myself inspired by his unwavering passion, his relentless pursuit of knowledge, and his humility in the face of monumental achievements. So Harry, as you embark on this new chapter of your life, I want to express my deepest gratitude for your tireless dedication, your passion for AI, and your unwavering commitment to students have shaped us into better researchers, better thinkers, and better human beings. Congratulations on the well-deserved retirement, Harry, and a heartfelt thank you for everything. Thanks, everyone. He or she has. But for us, especially in the computer science department at the University of Rochester, we'll remember him for being honest, sincere, and always going out of his way to help others. That's exactly how we'll celebrate his legacy. So thank you, Henry, and we'll miss you. Futures Foundation, very exciting uh, uh, project. So Schmidt Futures uh, funds various uh, work in, in science, and so I'm helping uh, them shape a new program on open data sets for science. And so I have this wonderful job of spending like four months just uh, having Zoom calls with scientists from all around the world about um, what they're doing and uh, what kind of open data sets do we need. So, and I'm actually happy to talk with any of you if you've got ideas there. Uh, let, let me know, I'll add you to my list. Um, but what is next for the field? And uh, so, so Bart Selman hinted at this, uh, or more than hinted, kind of hit us over the head with it, um, <laughs> that we have discovered a, a different track to verbal intelligence. We can have 3.7 billion years of evolution and six years of childhood, or 45 actually terabytes of text and six months of training. <coughs> and um, there are many people still dispute that the chat GTP4 is intelligent. I, I, I think it is. It's not, again, it's not human intelligence. Um, it's not even, I sometimes make the analogy with octopus, that an octopus has a nervous system very unlike a human, and yet it can be intelligent. Obviously, chat GDP is even um, um, more, diff more different than us than, than an octopus, uh, but it's a kind of convergent evolution. And uh, <coughs> pretty much whenever someone talks about its shortcomings, uh, you'll discover two weeks later um, those shortcomings have been um, met. So one of the, the fascinating issues, um, uh, again, uh, uh, from the discussions with colleagues, is 
is how can um, how is this kind of verbal intelligence even possible? Because isn't it the case that to use a language in a meaningful way, it has to be grounded in your experience of, of the world? And it just seems how can free floating language lead to intelligence? And um, and Bart actually told me, well, well, look into Wittgenstein. So I asked uh, Chad GPP, tell me about Wittgenstein's theory of language. And he said, according to Wittgenstein, particularly in his later work, Philosophical Investigations, language obtains meaning through its use in specific contexts, which he refers to as language games. He claims that the meaning of a word is determined by the way it is used within a particular language game, along with the rules, conventions, and practices that govern its use. So now this doesn't um, prohibit language from being grounded in the real world. But what it says, if, uh, if we can believe that Wittgenstein is no dummy, that um, uh, language is not necessarily just based on uh, grounding in the physical world, but is its own game, just like we saw uh, with AlphaGo, it's, it's a game. So this has a lot of impacts. Um, what is it's, it's pretty much changing how computer science, uh, it, I think it has to be, will be taught and how computers will be used. So we're really moving from programming to persuasion. So I wanted to figure out about this idea of knowledge engineering. Because I've heard, well, you just asked ChatGP um, to do something. And I thought, well, ChatGP is not particularly good at arithmetic, so I'll teach it to use a calculator. And so this is literally uh, the prompt that I used. Um, so I just say to it, I'm giving you the ability to use a calculator. All you need to do when you need to evaluate an arithmetic expression is to output that uh, calculate with parentheses an expression, where the expression is an arithmetic expression, and then I define uh, that the expression contains numbers, these operators, and those functions. And do you understand? And is it short? <laughs> okay. Now, I could then have ChatGPT4 do the following. And I'm actually running my input through a little filter that I wrote. So I first send in this, uh, this uh, request. Please calculate the definite integral of sine x times cosine x from x equals 0 0.2 to x equals 0 0.8. <coughs> ChatGTP has actually learned a lot about symbolic mathematics, so it, it has no trouble uh, determining what the antiderivative is, and then it knows it needs to evaluate this expression for the definite integral. And at that point, it would give you kind of a rough answer, but instead it says, um, calculate this, this expression. My little interface then saw the word calculate, pulled it out, sent it uh, to a Python routine that uh, calculated the number, gave it back to chat GTP, and then GTP says the definite integral is approximately 0 0.2376. So again, this is, I certainly did not invent this. This is, this is what people have been talking about in terms of, of um, uh, prompt engineering. And the fact is you can, you can do it yourself. Um, and in fact, this is leading more generally to this idea of augmented language models. And this is just one of a uh, recent overview paper, which talks about how you could use a language model as one part of a, of a system uh, that is taking input from a user for many different tasks, but then is, uh, has plugins or is able to use many different kinds of tools, a search engine, a robot, a uh, diffusion model to create images, and uh, so on. And uh, if you want to get into this, look into something called LangChain that I'll mention again in a minute, which is one of the most popular frameworks for hooking together uh, large language models with other kinds of software. And this also gives us an approach to embodied AI, to finally now uh, close this gap between what um, the AI is saying and the physical world. 
So this is just one of the many pieces uh, of work that's coming out. There's a new paper every couple days. Uh, code as policies, language model programs for embodied control. And uh, here is that she's taking English and turning it into a program that is then executed by a robot. But in fact, much more sophisticated, um, already more sophisticated kinds of language are being uh, uh, turned into a robot control, including with sensing and feedback. Now this has led to a fear of AI. A, this, there's a coming AI apocalypse. And we see the world's greatest thinkers, uh, <laughs> world's greatest AI experts there, um, uh, have all said, you know, we need to stop this AI stuff for at least six months until Alon can get his company up and running. <laughs> and, and, and we see the top government officials who are going to tell us how to um, regulate AI. In fact, already uh, Spain has banned chat GTP. The European Union looks to heavily regulate it or ban it because it, it violates, they, they say it violates users' privacy because it's using information that people freely posted on the internet for purposes they did not uh, pre-approve. And because I think the hysteria over this, US polls uh, now when you ask, 60% of people say AI is dangerous. Uh, but where are the real dangers? I think the one that people point to most often is AI created disinformation, right? That, that, um, uh, that we currently live in a world where you can pretty much believe what you read on the internet, and AI is going to make it possible to have things like this out there um, that did not really happen. Although I have to admit, it's a pretty amusing uh, picture. <laughs> this came out, of course, on uh, the day before he was uh, he went to his arraignment. Um, and it was a satiric piece. I don't think anybody believed it. Uh, but we know that disinformation or lying, to use the traditional word, uh, goes back throughout human history. Um, one of the most famous cases in terms of the media, 1895, um, the Spanish-American War was started because of false news reports claiming that the battleship Maine was sunk by Spain, when really it was just uh, because there were some improperly stored munitions. But you, you can go back to the invention of the printed, printing press and before to find examples of um, uh, of lies, of, you know, people are just very good at lying and and spreading it to huge populations. So, in some sense, uh, perhaps with a, a, I, I kind of think that's not a that's not a case where um, the AI is is bringing us this big new challenge. Now, the one the one counter argument I have heard to this, but has some validation is that it brings down the cost of disinformation, uh, just like spam, just like spam email. And I think the solutions might, though, again, involve technical solutions, um, uh, just like we now have spam filters that do a 90% plus job of filtering out spam email. Another uh, source of worry is autonomous weapons. Uh, these are not being really used by the U.S. The U.S. does not deploy any fully autonomous weapons, although you can go out and buy one if you'd like to. From here, this one from Quantic, North America, but there, in fact, there are lots of uh, suppliers in, in other countries. Um, but people make terrible mistakes uh, during wars, and I think there's good reason to think that um, simply putting that, that in fact, uh, autonomous weapons might cut uh, collateral, what they call collateral damage, the, unex, the un, this, uh, unintended uh, damages from uh, weapons. And we, we saw many cases of that uh, over the last few years where, again, uh, uh, there were like autonomous drones, but at uh, tracking people around, and then a human decided, oh, this person 
uh, is a terrorist, they really are just a water carrier, and, and, and they got killed. It's not clear to me that a uh, AI system would have made those same mistakes. And of course, meanwhile, we have wars where um, uh, civilians are quite intentionally uh, targeted, again, by humans. And so this brings to this issue of AI <coughs> ethics. And, and this is a uh, uh, sort of my position that uh, almost uh, <coughs> nobody agrees with me on it. Everybody I brought it up to <laughs> disagrees with it pretty strongly, uh, or from mild to extreme to like, <laughs> you know, leave the room. Um, Andrew Ng said that AI is a new electricity. And this was even before, you know, large language models. And I think, you know, this is a great analogy. There is no such thing as ethical electricity. The safe use of electricity is governed by the Electrical Code Coalition. So that's the Underwriters Laboratory, the National Fire Protection Association, uh, the people in, in various cities who write building codes, public-private partnerships. The unethical use of electricity is handled by ordinary laws. So if you go and shine a light in a neighbor's window, that's a public nuisance law. If you, you know, take power cables and you go and you electrify your neighbor's um, <laughs> bed, so they, uh, that's laws against murder. And I really think there's no such thing as unethical unethic or unethical AI per se, right? There are obviously unethical uses of an AI, but what we really need is safe use of AI that it does what it says it does. Right, so what this means is accreditation that an AI system meets performance standards. And these standards really know, need to go far beyond just our metrics of simple accuracy, which are, can be often misleading. So we need robustness to noise. We need the false positive versus the false negative rates on various designated subsets of the domain. Right, so it makes a big difference. You say my system is 95% accurate, um, but that in that 5% where it's inaccurate are all um, uh, people of color, then obviously you've got a problem, right? Um, uh, so you want those, those uh, even those errors to be more randomly distributed. Uh, a, a point that I think one of the earlier speakers also made is uh, this current, many of these current systems don't provide a confidence in their results. So if you're going to use this in government, in business, uh, the system needs to, um, for every individual prediction, be able to s assign that some confidence, right? So it makes, uh, again, uh, the, the output of the system uh, more trustworthy. Uh, when we come down to ethical use, I think we can get 95% of the way there with existing laws against fraud, violence, and discrimination. So we should uh, be wary of passing a lot of new laws, uh, but what we should be focusing on are these kinds of um, uh, public-private partnerships to create uh, uh, the, the equivalent of the UL standards for AI. And, you know, I said the, the other, reason I, 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 you know, people talk about sort of the Terminator scenario is, again, uh, perhaps a bit cynically, I think people do a pretty good job of being terrible to each other. So a really smart AI would just leave us to our own devices. Um, but let's be more positive. And this actually connects to the work I've been doing at Schmidt Futures, getting, me, getting really excited about the way AI is having a positive impact on science. And those scientific breakthroughs are going to solve so many problems in, in health, in food, in uh, energy, in environmental protection. You just go down the list. Um, uh, uh, we, you know, we worry about the um, pollution by forever chemicals and, and plastics in the environment. Well, what if we could have alternatives to that? We need to create new materials. So uh, here's uh, one researcher, um, the Matter Lab, uh, uh, Alain Espuru uh, guzik at Toronto. Uh, he has a robotic laboratories that um, 
where they're doing work on developing new materials, and the uh, they have sort of a, a fluidic, fluidic um, uh, uh, systems and robots that are, are planning that help plan the experiments, carry out the experiments, and then depending on the results, do the next set of experiments. So speeding up this process of finding materials with with desirable properties by orders of magnitude, and um, uh, the. Canadian government just gave them $200 million to expand this particular effort. In biology, if we could generate our own um, uh, uh, proteins that had a desired shape, we could cure you know, almost every disease. We could, we could uh, stop the bad microbes, we could um, encourage uh, good ones, we could, by basically uh, these, uh, the proteins uh, latch onto RNA and DNA and uh, control the expression of those, um, uh, of those, those essentially the programs of life. And so this is work from Dave Baker's lab on designing protein binders using the fusion model. So imagine instead of creating, you know, these cool pictures, uh, you, you say, Okay, I've determined that this particular site is the one that I want to um, block. And it will design a, a, a protein that folds itself up to the shape that, as it bounces around in the cell, will just attach at that spot. Uh, chemistry, um, one of the exciting things we did with the Gergen Institute is hire interdisciplinary scientists, and one of them was Andrew White in the department of, of chemical engineering. He's become in, uh, very influential for his work uh, using uh, large language models together with uh, chemistry tools for everything from extracting uh, data from the ch uh, chemical literature to uh, helping automate uh, uh, analysis and, and plan experiments. So his, his system called uh, ChemCro uh, so it, it, it is, is getting um, uh, an awful lot of attention. He also has written a, a, a very neat online textbook of deep learning for chemists. So for any uh, technology to actually be used, it ultimately has to be designed into some kind of thing, some kind of product. And this is again a place where we're starting to see uh, big advances. So this is uh, Fayez Ahmed at MIT uh, using multimodal machine learning in engineering design. And the example here is um, on, on a car, although the, the, the I think the most impactful um, work he's doing to date has been on designing uh, medical devices. So you can design devices to meet specifications and as it's Creative design is taking into account how to how to manufacture that device, so you can get devices that are much cheaper and faster to manufacture. So my final message for the field at all is to um, uh, okay, we've heard about the dangers of AI. Maybe let's turn down the volume a bit. Um, let's really you know worry more about man-made disasters and as opposed to a potential harm of AI. Because I think in general, our uh, intelligence, human or machine, is a good thing. And I think it's fascinating we're going to be living in this world uh, with uh, a, you know, another intelligent species. And um, you know, it, it, it didn't come from space. We thought it came from space. It came, came from our laboratories. Uh, but we do need to have more and very serious conversations about uh, AI metrics and safety standards. Uh, and we need to be paying a lot more attention to how AI for science is already starting to save the world. So I said safe by design, materials and chemicals, cures, uh, industrial revolution in manufacturing, solutions for energy, transportation, education, and uh, uh, much more. The U.S. is not actually uh, 
particularly investing in AI right now. I mean, it's at an increased level. It's basically flat. It's the same money just sort of shifted around than, than it was 10 years ago. And it certainly, if you look with inflation, it's not keeping up. So, um, uh, and perhaps if, if, we, if there's more attention paid to all the good we're getting, all the social good, uh, then perhaps we, you know, then perhaps a society we can say, you know, let's go ahead and invest more. So, so that's the end of my, my, that's my final message for the field, and I guess my final, yeah, and for those of you who are still our active researchers, take this, take this to heart. Um, uh, don't go around telling people you don't believe that there's such a thing as ethical AI unless you like arguments and, and being unpopular at the cocktail party, uh, but do secretly believe it. Uh, uh, and get to work also on, on more rigorous uh, metrics for, for AI uh, uh, being trustworthy. And then thank you to, to all of you. I said I, I am really overwhelmed uh, by everyone's uh, comments by uh, your, uh, your your statements. I, I find it a little hard to believe. I'm a little bit a little bit dizzy from the experience, <laughs> but I, I am extremely grateful. Thank you.
very much. Yeah. All set for the next pandemic. <laughs> But, but I just want to thank all the speakers, uh, whether you uh, uh, came in.